I'm gonna basically go through and 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 just introduce uh, Michelle here, who's um, then gonna introduce this whole crew. So uh, from there, I'll let you guys ride. But um, just some background in case you don't know. Sorry, guys. Um, Michelle's working in mathematics and uh, high energy physics until he decided his background in science it was probably the right thing to help tackle problems of world health and other social issues. Uh, perpetually disruptive, this flagship project makes it possible for people to manufacture their own medications at home. Open source and made from off the shelf parts, the Apothecary Micro Lab puts many medications within the reach of those who would otherwise not have them. The project would garnered his group the most press was the EpiPencil. Uh, an open source version of the EpiPen, which costs only thirty dollars to produce and three dollars to refill. I have used this. My son requires it, and uh, with one source of provider for EpiPens and uh, the cost that it takes to uh, to buy that. Uh, thank you for that personally. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here. This is a really, really, really happy moment for me because in my health work, which is different than this, several things happen. I come up and I talk about things that I didn't have much of a hand in except for organizing. I'm bragging about great work that other people did and I can't even give them credit because we work in the gray area that's in the darker side of Heather as I call it and so they shouldn't be named. And I've been so welcomed by the biohacking community and I've never felt like I really deserved the label. But today I do. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna bring up my guys here. Um, the first thing here is that this was a collaborative effort and I wanna bring up Nick Titus and um, as well as Zach Shannon um, who've been working at the core of this. Um, Fort Thieves Vinegar is, of course, my organization. Solitary is uh, Zach's. Myonic is Nick's. And, of course, we could not have done this without Cassix, who I think you all know, who's a champ and made this all possible. Um, so we also would like to do a special thanks to a couple of people, specifically Left Anonym and Matthias Strube, who helped us a great deal, as well as Nebula. Um, who I think is here, uh, Bunny, who's not an Ashley Hanth, um, Galt, and Control Creep, and my favorite childhood author. <laughs> so, we've got a problem. We were so excited, I was so excited when the internet was built, it was going to fix everything. We were going to be connected. It was going to be free. It was going to be impossible to censor. It was going to be impossible to surveil, and all of that is not the case, and we're paying for it, and it doesn't work. There's a backbone. We're reliant on infrastructure. Everything you do online is watched all the time by any number of places, and it can be shut down at a moment's notice depending on where you are. This is a disaster. We dream of it looking like this. Every device could just be part of our network. Why does it have to have a backbone? It could be better. We want it to be better. We dream of it being better. And the technology exists for it to be better. Now, this is not our technology, and this is why we thank Matthias, because he built the Pirate Box platform. This is an open network that is not connected to anything, local area network. And there's a phone app that you can get, you can run it on your laptop, and you can build it into uh, routers. And all of a sudden you have an anonymized network where you can chat, there are forums, you can trade, upload, download files, you can stream, and they're super easy to build. And um, this is sort of what it looks like when you, when you pull it up. And here's one that I built. So this is a battery powered router. You can see it's fairly small, depending on your definition of small which is a critical definition. Um, and I brought this to Grindfest, and this is the inside. And I think Nick here is gonna talk a little bit about what happened when we were at Grindfest, and we're gonna just sort of go through it. 
So uh, it was about three months ago, back in May, um, we were out in the desert in California in Tehachapi at Grindfest. Grindfest is a um, grinder biohacking meetup, um, and Michael had this um, little board booted up so that we could do lo local file sharing. It had a chat room, all this sort of thing, and left, who was in attendance, saw that and said, hey, do you think you could implant that in me? And being the environment it was, we figured, uh, maybe, why not? Why not give it a shot? And so we opened up that little white box, um, and we found this board inside, um, and we depopulated all of the unnecessary parts. So we took off um, ports that we didn't need. We took off um, a few larger components, um, got those all scraped down, stripped down. We took out the battery because um, if you know anything about implantables, that is one of the big points of contention right now is putting a battery inside of somebody. So we wanted to avoid that. We added in 64 gigabytes of USB storage soldered onto the board. Um, and then from there, we solved the powering problem using a Qi charging coil. So um, we came up with this idea that theoretically it could be able to be powered um, through the skin just by a wireless battery. Um, we had to scrape off and grind off some of these more uh, stubborn um, some of the more stubborn ports on there. It was uh, about a two-day process, and we were just using all of the parts that we happen to have there um, in the lab. So then we get it all finished. We got it coated in a biocompatible resin that Jeff did here. And um, from there, the implant the implantation started. So the rest is gory. Um, Fair warning. Yes. So in a clean room, in a clean facility... Um, we had the first prototype um, implanted into Left's arm. This is the roughest of these photos. Um, so this was all done by somebody who's trained. <laughs> but there's the device. It's pretty metal, pretty cyberpunk. Um, and that is it in, after, all sutured up. Um, I think the next photo shows it off a little bit better once all the blood's out of there. Um, there is the device under somebody's skin. This is not a bone sticking out. That is a drainage tube that allows fluid um, to come out. But once it was in Left's arm... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so this one I had to put in because yeah. this is the best compliment any of us have ever gotten. <laughs> and I just want to say thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> this was... This was a comment given by Technicolor. Um, they said this right at the end of, uh, of all of Grindfest. And this is that implant today, um, or a few weeks ago, after it's healed. Um, so a pretty gnarly scar there, but it's under the skin, and everything ended up working on there. So um, Left is the first person to have this um, first device implanted. It has 64 gigs of local storage. And by holding um, a wireless battery up to it, they can power it on and have that local network just under their, under their skin. Um, so that was all built in two or three days with just the parts that we had on hand. Um, and then after all that ordeal, we decided to take another step. So Zach and I worked um, a lot trying to get these bits and pieces to come together to try and build a new version that was smaller with more data density and the key thing, trying to make it so that they would mesh between each other because the thing that makes the magic possible of all of the ideas of building a new internet is if they all talk to each other. So we needed to make that happen. And um, this is a picture of us at our best, clearly, <laughs> visually, um, when we were on a video call with Matthias, who was such a champ, he came off of vacation with his family and set up a video call with us in the middle of the night between Singapore, wherever you live, <laughs> and, and Germany, somewhere in the U.S. So, yeah. So you want to say a little bit about the technical side of this and what we ran up against? So, yeah, we were, we were trying to figure out the networking, and a lot of the documentation was very vague or translated from non-English. Um, but, uh, yeah, Matthias was a great help. He was able to, you know, actually sketch out diagrams and walk us through all the steps of what is actually happening and, you know, with the topology of everything. So that, that really helped us uh, know what we were supposed to be doing as opposed to what we were supposed to end up with. Um, but so 
we, we were trying to get it to be smaller than version one because that was a little bigger than some people would want to get in their skin. <laughs> <laughs> this is really tiny. It's is it 40 by 40 millimeters? Yeah, yeah this is yeah. 40 millimeters square. Um, so this is what we started working on. Uh, it does have, uh, you know, onboard radios, uh, a little bit of onboard storage, of course, with expandable. Uh, we were working on this uh, for a while and, um, you know, we, we were really hoping that we would be able to get this project done before DEF CON so we could actually show it off and, you know, show all you guys this stuff. So it doesn't have a built-in antenna. And so I was looking into some options, including using our actual skin as an antenna, which we, just spoiler alert, we ultimately did not use. Um, so this was a chip antenna that we looked at. It's really tiny, it's really powerful, and I, they have this technical drawings, and I figured out a way that it would lie over the corner, and I was so excited, and then that didn't work. Point, point being, we put a lot of work into that board before we decided that we should just go with a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> and from there, it took about a week to complete, and it was a lot simpler. It's, it's slightly larger, um, but... Um, like 20%. That it's, we, we were kind of doing a lot more overthinking than, than we should have been doing. Don't um, over-engineer your projects. <laughs> we'll regret it. So, so V2 is based on the, the Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, it, this is... This is the first time we got it booted and uh, connected to it. Um, uh, Michael was pretty uh, pretty hyped to see the screen. Yeah, th th this this is you know this is, makes my old school hacker heart just glow when you see ASCII text boot up from the thing that you've been working so hard to build. Um, and this is our splash page. This looks very much like the Pyrebox page, but um, it has a little extra verbiage and a different logo. But it, yeah, the functionality is the same. Um, now, th this SD card came out four days ago. <laughs> so the units we built only have a half terabyte. Only. <laughs> and yet, I'm not crying yet. Um, so here's what it looks like um, coded and powered up. Um, so the additional parts of the hardware to look at here um, this is next one's a little closer. There we go. So this is a this is a different unit that's also been coded. That's also booted up. You can see that um, this one this one's just a tester unit that has a 16 gig SD card. Um, on the other side, you'll see a couple of things. There's a second Wi-Fi card. That's the thing that's glowing blue, and there that's so that we can ha make the meshing happen. We had quite a battle trying to figure out ways to get these units to mesh without an external um, extra Wi-Fi? So, yeah, we, we got a successful network interface up. So two units together, powered together, will be able to communicate. But we spent so much time trying to get that interface up that we actually, at the moment, don't have any software running on the network. So we'll be asking you all about that later. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want to say something else about that? No, so the, uh, the other thing to look at here is that you'll see the sort of um, taupe chunk on the corner there. That's a, that's a capacitor. That's a 2200 microfarad tantalum capacitor. Now that's necessary because Qi charging is a protocol that's developed by the wireless charging consortium, not the wireless continuous power consortium, which is an entity which doesn't exist. So when you've got something that's designed to charge, it's going to give power, but dropping it intermittently is not a big deal as long as it can reconnect. So we need something that was going to buffer that power drop in between times so it wasn't just constantly knocking us offline. Um, I first did this with a super cap, and I was like, well, this is great, but you don't put electrolytics under your skin because they, like, explode. And other things that are, like, not great to have inside your body... Um, so we found this tantalum capacitor, um, uh, thanks to Nebula, wherever he is. Thank you, bro. Um, and, uh, and it worked like a charm. The other thing that you can see is that, so the board's been depopulated. All the ports are gone. Um, you'll see the four purple jumper wires going from the USB interface to the USB key. And then you'll see a little red wire and then a little gray wire 
coming off the power USB, this runs to the capacitor in parallel and then over to the Qi coil on the back. Um, so this is, again, you can connect to this using whatever device. So this is what the splash page looks like on a phone. And then once these were built, finally, um, we mailed them to Cassix and he coded them. And then we decided to put them in. Everybody ready? <laughs> <laughs> this is Cassix, who is made of steel and just grabbed the bite stick and said, I'll do the first one. <laughs> and this was amazing to witness. You can't see it in this picture, but I'm standing there as first assist, absolutely awestruck. Like, and this is how you get under the surface of the skin to make a pocket so that you can get the thing in there. And then when you get the thing in there, you kind of got to shove it a little bit, <laughs> let love it in there. And this is my favorite picture in the entire show. What's happening here is Zach has just connected. So you see how Kaz's hand has his battery to his leg. He had just finished suturing himself up and we're spinning the thing up in real time. Nick has just uploaded video of the procedure to his leg, which is now being streamed off of my laptop here. <laughs> it, and this is the most amazing thing. It was less than an hour that it took for him to do this by himself. I mean, I was there, but I brought him stuff. It wasn't like I was super useful. And then after it was ready, it was, I'm next. So that's my leg that he's building that same pocket in. And I am not made of steel. <laughs> um, so it was a little rougher for me, but here you can see the unit going in and in and in and here you can see my little like moment of hey hey Zach can you can you remind me why we're doing this I'm a little confused it's like a renaissance baby yeah because the next thing I did was faint this is him he's passed out here and I was checking his pulse and I was only out for a few seconds. I remember coming to hearing, well, he's got a pulse, well, then he's fine. Just hold his shoulder so he doesn't fall out of the chair. And I was like, whose shoulder do I have to hold? <laughs> and then I promptly threw up. <laughs> um, but happily ever after, <laughs> everything worked out. We had it going. And, and as you can see, I look a little better than in the previous photos. Um, now. Here's the thing that always comes up. When you've got an implant, people ask this question that can either be very interesting or very divisive, which is, what does your implant do that a wearable couldn't? And it's a really valid question. It's important because if we're actually going to the trouble of cutting ourselves open and sticking things in, we should have a reason. Even if that reason is, this is my form of self-expression and I want to be a cyborg and that's important. And like, you know, I mean, that's part of it. There are arguments that can be made for people who are maybe working in political activism, people are, who are maybe working with sensitive data. This is a way that you can discreetly transfer that sort of data, um, bring that out into the world, um, cross maybe enemy lines and um, not have it detected um, after left first got her implant and then traveled um, back to the UK. They uh, made it through security without any sort of hiccups. Um, there was no, uh, there was nothing through going through the scanners that caused any problems. So there's an argument to be made there. Uh, it's a little bit flimsy. Um, the real reason is self-expression and being a cyborg and that sort of thing. However, there are a number of things that this does from a technical standpoint that haven't been done before. Um, first off, it has more storage than anything that's ever been implanted before by a large margin. Making both Michael and Jeff the highest digital capacity humans on the earth. <laughs> <laughs> um, additionally, 
uh, with the exception of version one, this is the first thing to take wireless power as its only power source. And this seems very promising because as any grinder will tell you, designing an implant, your biggest problem is where does the power come from? And being able to have a battery, like being able to have no battery so that there's no battery to run out or fail or blow is, is a huge jump. This, we believe, could be the first step towards a sort of network of implants that could all be powered just using a centralized battery um, and wires going to each implant with just a charging coil instead of having to worry about those batteries under the skin. And additionally, the key, key, key thing is that they talk to each other. And ultimately, this is the thing that we're dreaming of because if we all are just nodes, if you imagine where you live, and you imagine every computer, every router, and every phone being a node on a mesh network, then at least your local infrastructure can go away. I mean, how many times, I'll, this is great, just an hour ago, we were upstairs and we're like, well, I, I need to send you that big image. Oh, what's that? God, how, I can't connect to the Wi-Fi because I don't actually have a room number. Wait, how do we, and then suddenly we were like, wait, we just solved this problem spin up the peg leg. And that's how we traded every picture you just saw in this entire thing. And we did it an hour ago. Um, so we're looking at what to do next. Uh, Zach, you want to jump in? So yeah, so here, here's some of our ideas going forward. First of all, actually utilize the the meshing network that we worked so hard to uh, to integrate, whether that be just, you know, uh, file sync between nodes or actual like real-time communication uh, between users like instant messaging, VOIP even. Um, and that's just on the current hardware. So going forth for um, future hardware is, uh, you know, try to um, eliminate additional uh, radios because theoretically we don't actually need that second Wi-Fi radio to do what we're trying to do. Oh, um, uh, however, I should just mention the other thing is that our, the, our peg leg units will mesh with pirate boxes that are mesh enabled as well. So if you have one of those, we can chat. <laughs> um, and then uh, going forward, yeah, we're, you know, we've been discussing ideas the past few days with a few people that we, we've ran into about how small can we get this and how dope can we get this to be. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of ideas, uh, and we think that the, this kind of platform has a lot of potential of enabling like persistent storage within the body that you can't lose or uh, forget to grab or get stolen. And then, of course, like communication. Um, if you could have a decentralized communication platform that exists within you as opposed to relying on an internet connection, then that would be, that would be good. One, in, uh, one important thing about this V2, it's about an eighth of the size of the first one. It's about half as thick, a quarter of the footprint. Um, much, much smaller, but at the same time, it's still a multi-purpose computer board. It has GPIO on it. It has all these things that are still superfluous and unnecessary. Um, so with V3, um, there's theoretically you could get this down much much smaller for that we're thinking postage stamp size and something much thinner that could slide under the skin with a less gnarly procedure they're they're getting easier and easier um and we hope that that trend will continue and additionally the reason that i thank william gibson at the beginning is that if you remember the idea of an encrypted data courier it's, it's real even. now because what can happen is I can spin up my network in my leg, and you can put an encrypted file on it because it's an open network. And then if we make a deal and you give me a couple of bitcoins, I can fly to, oh, say mainland China or Hong Kong, and the person that needs your data can get it because I just walk in and I spin up my network. And because it's encrypted with your system, I don't have access to it. And if we all remember our favorite little short story that William Gibson wrote, for Omni Magazine in 1981. And now it's real. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? A dolphin? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, um, so we're raising dolphins currently. Um, we're trying to train them without 
um, giving them heroin. We're trying to do m more positive reinforcement because we believe in animal rights. Uh, we give them lots of hugs and cuddles and fish. And we don't enclose them. We try and lure them in from the wild to work with us voluntarily because, you know, consent is important. <laughs> so, yeah. um, we're going to pull the video um, out of my uh, computer for just a second. So bear with us for the, the blue screen. So uh, while this presentation has been going on and while we we're in the back of the room there, <laughs> don't know what that is. Oh, that's. <laughs> this, this is no bueno. Wait, bear with that's us. That's somebody's moment. desktop background. Is it, um, it's a new laptop. <laughs> this, <laughs> we're doing the AV check now. But when I was back in the room earlier, we filmed, uh, we filmed the introduction to this and then we transferred that to a peg leg and um, then download, I transferred it uploaded it from my phone and then we downloaded it on this laptop. Um, so now we can watch that. This was just carried over that system. Um, yeah. Here's the actual unit still warm in my hand from the stream and um, we'll have a couple of these and you can come take a look at them. Um, so, this is the big deal. Pirate Box is about to be shut down. Matias said he's not going to do any more work because he doesn't have any help and he doesn't have any time. Now, I know there are developers in this room. I know that everyone in this room knows a developer or three or ten or five hundred. Please, please go help this man build this platform. It is so important. It is so important. It's the reason that I, I let a dear friend stab me and, <laughs> and put electronics under my skin. This is important. So we have these two QR codes. That, oh, oh, we need to, uh, sorry. I thought I had my screen up, but I didn't hear. So I have these two QR codes, which should come up in a moment. Um, the one on the left is the one for connecting to the Pyrebox development page. You can go there and you can ask Matthias and say, how can I help? Here's, if you, you know, if you have any skills that are pertinent, help this man because he's doing it solo and he's going to stop if he doesn't get any help. Go help him. He's on Twitter too. Okay. Go find him. He's awesome. Um, if you want to see our little page that has like a modicum of documentation, um, it's on the, it's the other QR code. And that, that has some more information about the project. It has some people that we thank, and it also has that documentation. Remember, we built this using all off-the-shelf parts. It's something that anybody can build. That's a big purpose of this whole thing. And that's the thing. If you don't want to put this under your skin, it becomes significantly easier. You literally can flash an SD card, stick it in a Raspberry Pi Zero W, attach a second Wi-Fi card, and it will spin up. I mean, it's a 15-minute build. It's incredible. Um, so... The, yeah, let's go make it better. Thank you all so much. And when I recover emotionally here, we'll take a few questions. I'll let Nick start. Go. <laughs> uh, yes. So, uh, a lot of these single board computers uh, put out a lot of heat. How do you all manage that? So in the testing that we've done, um, the coating that it has helps, helps to kind of disperse that heat. It's not just the one chip that's in contact with your body. Um, that sort of helps to um, diffuse it, diffuse the heat. And so far, we haven't had any issues. And, and we stress tested that a lot before <laughs> deciding to put it in because, of course, you don't want something burning a hole in your leg or in my leg. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think that is mainly governed right now by um, the SD card. So writing that many, many times, reading that many, many times, um, that can have wear on it. Um, and so what we've done is um, what we've done is set it up so that it's doing that a minimum amount of times. I believe it's every five minutes that it rewrites in a single batch. Um, that way you have minimal wear. Um, but at the same time, it's not that complex to get them back out of your body and replace that sort of thing. So, so we've got about five minutes. We can take maybe one or two more. Yeah. If it goes to the airport, does it pull a metal detector and interfere with it? Uh, 
interfere. Like if it were running when you went through a metal detector, if you only went through a metal detector, it should be fine. If you went through a backscatter machine, I assume that you're going to have some pretty bad interference problems and you probably won't be able to hold a connection. But it, you, your power will probably not disconnect. So you could have it running continuously. And then once that thing is done scanning, then anything that's linked to it could probably reconnect. But again, that's one of the things is the power is all passive. So only if you put a battery up to it, is it running? Which so yeah, if, it, if it's off and I'm just walking around, then no big deal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there was one more over here. Yeah. Yes, monsieur. The green That's hair. Yeah. Uh, you consider running a capture the flag competition for your body. Yes. Sorry, say again? That'd be fine. Uh, capture the flag competition the for the peg legs. Um, let's talk. <laughs> maybe we can set that up. I think we have maybe one or two. Any, any other questions? Are, are we all done? <laughs> we have, do you have one, one more over here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you all so much. We are so happy about what we've done and we're going to celebrate. I think we're going to go have drinks and you're all invited. So thank you all so much for coming. Yeah.